Let my name be named on them, and the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. And when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, it displeased him, and he held up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head unto Manasseh's head. And Joseph said unto his father, Not so, my father, for this is my firstborn. Put thy right hand upon his head. And his father refused. Now, isn't it something all through these stories we've been reading about the younger being blessed over the elder? That, that motif just continues all through, the, all through the book of Genesis, all through this. And it says in verse 19, And his father refused and said, I know it, my son. I know what I'm doing. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. But truly his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. And he blessed them that day, saying, In thee shall, all, uh, shall Israel bless, saying, God make thee as Ephraim and Manasseh. And he said, Ephraim before Manasseh. And Israel said unto Joseph, Behold, I die. But God shall be with you and bring you again unto the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given to thee one portion above thy brethren, which I took out of the hand of the Amorite with my sword and with my bow. What we see here, Jacob, after reading that chapter, Israel, was blessing Joseph with a double portion. If you remember way back, Joseph was the, the eldest son of his favored wife, Rachel. And Joseph gave, or uh, Jacob gave Joseph the, the many-colored coat. Remember that? That was a sign that he was the favored son. And that's what made the brothers hate him so much. Well, here at the end of his life, he's giving Joseph the double portion, which was given to the, it should have been given to the eldest son. But instead he was giving it to Joseph because Joseph had two sons. And those two sons would become members of the tribes, the children of Israel. Now, we always talk about 12 tribes, but actually there were 13. If you just count Joseph as a tribe, then there would have been 12. But Joseph, there were two that came out of him. So there were really 13 tribes in the children of Israel. One of them, the tribe of Levi, was not given a portion of land. They were to be scattered, and we're going to see in a minute. They were to be scattered throughout all the cities of, of, uh, of Israel. But in chapter 49 now, and I, that was just kind of like a setup, because in chapter 49, it's when the, my, my, like a favorite chapter for me because it's a, it's a touching, heartfelt chapter of Jacob bidding farewell to his, to his sons and prophesying over them. He's prophesying over his sons. It says in verse 1 of chapter 49, And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together, that I might tell you what, what shall befall you in the last days. Gather yourselves together and hear ye sons of Jacob and hearken unto Israel your father. Jacob uses both of his names in addressing his sons. He calls them the sons of the trickster and your father, the prince of God. And he begins now in this passage to, to prophesy over his sons over his 12 sons, and as he prophesies over Joseph, he's really prophesying over two tribes. But he's prophesying over his 12 sons. And I thought tonight we would read through this and just talk about these 12 tribes. Some people believe that uh, the 12 tribes of Israel, if, if, you, if you know the history of Israel, after the death of Solomon, uh, Solomon had a son named Rehoboam, and Rehoboam became the king. And because of his foolishness, he didn't listen to the elders. The people came to Rehoboam, and they said, give us a tax cut. <laughs> okay, like, uh, you know, give us a break, because Solomon was hard on us. He made us work hard, and, he, and everything, you know, give us a break. And uh, Rehoboam went to the elders. He, I think all you guys probably know the story. He went to the elders of Israel, the old men, and he said, what should I do? And the old men said, give him a break. And he went to his young friends who hadn't been around long enough to know anything, and he said, what should I do? And they said, make it worse on him. So, like a dummy, he listened to his young friends. And he went out and he said, you know, my father uh, beat you with whips, I'll beat you with scorpions. I mean, he, was, he really poured it on. Well, that didn't go over too well with the, with the tribe. So, ten of the tribes, there was a man named Jeroboam who led ten of the tribes away from Jerusalem and up north. And from that point on, in the Old Testament, you read about the northern kingdom. Or sometimes those, those ten tribes, are, they're called Israel, or they're called Ephraim. They use the name Ephraim for those ten tribes. The only two tribes that remained 
back in Jerusalem were Judah, because that was their, their land, that was their city, and then uh, Benjamin. They stayed behind, but the rest went north. And from that point on, there was always this acrimony between the northern kingdoms and the southern kingdoms. <laughs> and when there was, if there ever was a, uh, you know, a, a peace between the two of them, it was usually because uh, the southern king was stupid enough to get in with the northern king because all the kings of the northern kingdoms were evil. They never had one good king. The southern kingdom had some good kings. They had kings like Asa and kings like Hezekiah, uh, Josiah, and so forth. They had, they had some good kings, and they had a lot of bad ones. Jehoshaphat was a good one, they had, and they had some bad ones. But the northern kingdom, they didn't have any. They were all rotten. They immediately, when Jeroboam led those ten tribes north, they immediately started to worship uh, the, a golden calf. They set up a false place of worship and so forth, and they fell into idolatry immediately. But there were 12 tribes. Uh, some people believe, and there's, there's, this, there's this, this uh, teaching out there, that 10 tribes, the, the 10 northern tribes, when they were taken into captivity by the Assyrians, they were taken into captivity first 100 years or so before Judah was by the Babylonians. But when the Assyrians took them captive, there's this teaching uh, that they went like up into Europe, and, there's, and it's called uh, British Israelism. And it's, it's like the 10 lost tribes of Israel really became the, the people of Europe and so forth, which is just it's kind of silly. Okay. Uh, we read about in the Revelation... In chapter 7, you can read about the 12 tribes listed there. How many, how many remember that? How many know what that's in, involved with? During the time of the tribulation, the revelation tells us that there will be 144,000 Hebrews, 12,000 from each tribe, who will go forth and they'll evangelize, they'll evangelize the earth. So it lets me know that Hebrews still retain their, their tribal heritage. They say some of the names that exist today, names like Kohen, they were like Levites. Uh, different names, different Hebrew names, actually refer to a, they can trace back to the tribe that they, that they descended from. So what we're going to read here is Jacob's prophecy, Israel's prophecy over his sons, and what was to happen with them. He says, I want to tell you what shall befall you in the last days. Gather yourselves together and hear. Now, starting in verse 3, he's going to be talking about and prophesying over each and every one of his sons. And we're going to talk a little bit tonight as we see the end, the end of the beginning about these different tribes. The first one was Reuben, and he says this in verse 3. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might." and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. Unstable as water, you shall not excel, because you went up to thy father's bed, then defiled thou it, and went up to my couch. Now we remember the story that Reuben, whose name means see a son, that was the firstborn of Leah. If you remember, after Rachel died, Reuben went in unto her handmaid, whose name was Bilhah, who was uh, Jacob's concubine, okay? That was, he went into his father's bedroom. That's a horrible thing. And, and because he did that, Reuben was the firstborn. He should have inherited the double blessing. He should have been the preeminent one, but he lost it when he defiled his father's bed. It says that he's doomed never to excel. Doomed never to excel. And really, Reuben, who should have been, his tribe should have been one of the preeminent ones, really don't hear that much about them, you know, in the, in the history of Israel. They didn't have any kind of preeminence, okay? Now, look at verse 5. He mentions Simeon and Levi in the same breath. He says, their brethren, instruments of cruelty are in their habitation, O oh, my soul, come not thou into their secret, unto their assembly. Mine honor, be not thou united 
For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they dig down a wall. Now you remember the story about they had a sister named Dinah. This is back in Genesis chapter 35. And we remember the story how Dinah was uh, raped by one of the, one of the Canaanite uh, one of the Canaanite men, and he wanted to marry her. He wanted to take her to himself. So they said, well, if you want to marry one of our sisters, you have to be circumcised. And when they all got circumcised, they went in and killed them all. So they had all this blood on their hands. And Jacob says, your, 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 your anger, your, your, uh, your vicious, Simeon and Levi, he says in verse 7, Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Now here's a prophecy that Jacob uttered over these two tribes. Simeon, whose name means hearing, became noted for being a very, very valiant tribe in battle. In fact, uh, if you read through the, through the history of Joshua and so forth, they helped Judah take their land. But they never, they never fully had a land of their own. They settled in like the cities of Judah, and they had a small portion of land, but they never really occupied it. So they were scattered according to, to Jacob's prophecy. Levi, of course, they became, uh, the tribe of Levi became the priestly tribe. And they never had a land of their own. They were scattered. They had 48 cities. They, they never had an inheritance as far as land goes. Or a particular place. But one thing about the Levites, and again, they were very zealous for God. When Moses was up on the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments and they built the golden calf, and when Moses came back down, he said, who's going to be on my side? And the Levites got behind him. And they're the ones that went through the camp killing all the idolaters. And if you go a little further in Numbers chapter 25, when uh, you read about uh, Balaam, the prophet, who taught uh, the, the Moabites to send the, the, the women down into the camp to cause the Israelite men to, to, to fall and to fall into uh, fornication. It was a Levite that went and, and killed a guy who was with a woman. He like put a, put a sword through to both of them. So these were, these were very angry, very impetuous men, Simon, uh, Simeon and Levi. And again, the prophecy that, that Jacob put forth came true in their, in their uh, conquest of the promised land. If you look at verse 8, Judah, now we come, remember we said here a few weeks ago, that Judah, Reuben got cast aside because he slept with his dad's concubine. The other two were cast aside because they were bloody men. Judah became the one through whom the Messiah would come. Listen to what he says in verse 8. Judah, you are he whom thy brethren shall praise. Because the name of Judah means praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp from the prey, my son. Thou art gone up. He stooped down. He couched as a lion. And as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Binding his foal unto the vine, and his ass is cold unto the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine, and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes shall be red with wine, and his teeth white with milk. What a wonderful prophecy of the one who would come through the line of Judah to be the Messiah. We read here that even though Joseph received the birthright when, when Jacob in the last chapter laid his hands on his sons, Judah received the crown of leadership. The descendants of Judah would be the ones who would govern the nation of Israel. In 1 Chronicles chapter 5 and 2, and you don't have to turn there, it says, Judah prevailed above his brethren, and of him came the chief ruler, but the birthright was Joseph's. That's what the writer of Chronicles says. It was through Judah that Messiah would come. It says, uh, it talks about the ruler, the chief prince, the lion of the tribe of Judah, an everlasting leader who would come with judgment and purity. In verses 11 and 12, that language there talks about like abundance, a golden age, the millennial kingdom. 
It says that the scepter will not depart from him nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. We know that King David was a descendant of Judah. And it was his line that governed Israel until, until they lost their, their kingdom. But it will be his line. We talk about the throne of David, the seat of David. That's where Jesus is going to sit when he returns. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. So again, Jacob is speaking prophecy. Israel is pronouncing, is, 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 is writing history before it happens. He goes on with some of these other ones. In verse 13, he talks about Zebulun. Shall dwell in the haven of the sea, and he shall be for a haven of ships, and his border shall be unto Zidon. Zebulun's territory, if you get a map and it shows you the territory of, of Israel, Zebulun was right around where, where Galilee was. It was that area. And it, it, it bordered, uh, in some places it bordered the Mediterranean Sea, and it bordered the, the Sea of Galilee. So when it talks about being a haven, uh, talking about where ships would anchor, okay? But it was right up there where Galilee. Ten of the twelve disciples, or I'm sorry, eleven of the twelve disciples came from, came from the, the land of Zebulun, Galilee. Okay. The next one he mentions is Issachar. Verse 14, Issachar is a strong ass couching down between two burdens. And he saw that rest was good and the land that it was pleasant and bowed his shoulder to bear and became a servant under tribute. Issachar talks about him being strong like a donkey, like an ass. We use that word a little derogatory, but in the Bible it's not used that way. It talks about him being very, very strong. And it also talks about they would come into a place where they would start to pay tribute. And the nation of Issachar, they fell into, uh, because of idolatry, they fell into, if you read the book of Judges, they were, they were conquered by one of the surrounding uh, nations, and they had to pay tribute. There was a judge that came out of Issachar whose name was Tola. They had a very fertile land, which was a target for their enemies. So again, this was fulfilled at a time when they took the promised land. Look at uh, the next one in verse 16. It says that Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent by the way, an adder in the path that bites the horse heels, so that his riders shall fall backward. I have waited for thy salvation, O God." He prophesies over Dan. Dan was the first of the tribes. And again, if you read through Joshua and Judges, they were, they were uh, the, one of the first of the tribes to fall into idolatry. They never fully conquered their land. The, the portion of land that was allotted to them, they tried to conquer, but the Philistines drove them out. So if you remember a few weeks ago, we were reading from the book of Judges, how it was Dan that sent, they sent a, a, an expedition north to look for a place where they could settle where the resistance wasn't that bad. And they went up there and they immediately uh, set up a, a, false, a false religion. They were one of the first ones. Dan is the only tribe not mentioned. If you go to Revelation chapter 7, they don't mention the tribe of Dan. They don't mention the tribe of Dan there. They were the first ones to fall into idolatry. They were the first ones to cause, be like a serpent, by the way, to, to bite at the heels of people coming by. In verse 19, Gad, a troop, shall overcome him, but he shall overcome at the last. Uh, the name Gad means overcoming victory. They were one of the tribes that did not cross Jordan. They settled on the other side of Jordan. They, it looked good to them, so they didn't enter into the promised land. And because of that, they were, they were, they were subject to constant uh, marauders. They were, they were like a nomad tribe. And, and being on that side of Jordan, they didn't have the protection of the other tribes with them. So they were constantly being attacked and being uh, encountering enemies. So they were always fighting for their territory. Verse 20, out of Asher, his bread shall be fat, and he shall yield royal dainties. Asher, that name means happy, a prediction, a prediction of abundance. The city of Tyr was in the 
area that Asher was supposed to have. If you know anything about the city of Tyre, they provided workmen for Solomon's temple. It was also a place where Zarephath was, and we've all heard of the widow of Zarephath, uh, the one who provided for uh, Elijah when he was, he was fleeing in, in, in the middle of the famine. Uh, so they provided for Solomon's temple the dainties for the kingdom. Uh, a, a very famous descendant of Asher was Anna, the prophetess. If you remember in the, in the uh, story when Mary and Joseph came to, the, came to the, uh, the temple and Simeon was there and there was this prophetess named Anna was there. She was descended from Asher. The next one in verse 21, Naphtali is a hind let loose. He gives goodly words. Naphtali means my wrestling. And it's like uh, a hind let loose. It's really referring to almost like an animal who's been set free. And if you read in the Judges, the book of Judges, a very famous uh, person from Naphtali was um, a ruler named Barak, not Barack Obama. <laughs> but Barak was the king who defeated Sisera, and, and uh, Deborah was the prophetess, if you remember. Deborah was a prophetess, and she said, Barak, you've got to go against Sisera to free us from this, you know, the tyranny. And Barak says, I'm not going unless you're going with me. So Deborah went with them, and they had a great victory and so forth. But that was Naphtali. In verse 22, Israel says, Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough for a, by a well, whose branches run over the wall. The archers have so, uh, sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him. But his bow, his, his bow abode in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. Even by the God of thy father who shall help thee, and by the Almighty who shall bless thee with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lies underneath, blessings of the breast and of the womb. The blessings of thy father have prevailed above the blessings of my progenitors unto the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the, on the head of Joseph and on the crown of his head of him that was separate from his brethren. Israel loved Joseph. He was his favorite son. He was his favorite son. And he's speaking all these blessings on him. He's talking about all the blessings that's going to befall Joseph. Now, there was no tribe of Joseph, but there were two tribes that we talked about at the very beginning. Ephraim and Manasseh. Manasseh was the elder of the two. Half of the tribe of Manasseh stayed on the other side of Jordan, did not cross over. Okay, the other half did. Uh, there were some great leaders that came out of uh, Manasseh. Jephthah, again in the book of Judges, remember the story of Jephthah. And also uh, Gideon was of the tribe of Manasseh. And we know that there's a great story of Gideon. Ephraim, he was the younger one, but he was the preeminent one. He took the leadership of the northern tribes, as we mentioned before. Joshua came from Ephraim. Deborah came from Der uh, 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 Ephraim. Most of the kings of the northern tribes came, came from Ephraim, the bad kings, okay? But Ephraim was the prominent tribe of the northern tribes. Finally, he comes to the very last. Benjamin shall raven as a wolf. In the morning he shall devour the prey, and at night... He shall divide the spoil. Benjamin, uh, whose name means son of my right hand, was noted. His warriors were very swift and ferocious. They were, they, were, they were great fighters. And there's even a time in the book of Judges that they almost wiped the tribe of Benjamin out because they had overstepped their bounds, and that's, that's another story. But uh, how many people know, can think of some famous people who came out of Benjamin? Anybody take a guess? Go ahead. Saul? Saul? And Paul, two Sauls, because Paul was originally Saul. King Saul from the Old Testament was a Benjamite. And the Apostle Paul was a Benjamite. Paul said, I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, of the tribe of Benjamin. So a lot of famous people came out of some of these tribes. Now, what we really want to get to, the, the end of the beginning, okay, if you read the rest of chapter 49, Jacob, well, let's read it. And he, uh, verse 28, and these are the 12 tribes of Israel. And this is it that their father spoke unto them and blessed them. Everyone according to his blessing, he blessed them. 
And he charged them and said unto them, I am to be gathered unto my people, bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephraim the Hittite. And he gives them instructions of where he wants to be buried. And he goes on and it says, Uh, verse 33. And when Jacob made an end of commanding his sons, he gathered up his feet into the bed and yielded up the ghost and was gathered unto his people. So Israel dies. And he leaves these 12 sons in Egypt, not in the land that was promised him, but these 12 sons and their families are in Egypt. They're living in, in, in a nice place called the land of Goshen. Their one brother is the second most powerful man in Egypt, second most powerful man in the world. So things are looking pretty good. When Jacob died, he died a blessed man. Now you think of all those years he spent mourning his son Joseph, because he thought he was dead. God allowed him to see his son again. He allowed him to see, God allowed Israel to see his hand moving just as he had promised his hand moving to establish his people as a nation who would bless the entire earth. So I believe that Israel went on to be with the Lord with a, a satisfied heart. God blessed him in a, in a special way. It says in chapter 50, and, and here's where we want to get to. Actually, drop, drop down to verse 7. It says, Joseph went up to bury his father, and with him went up all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his house, and all the elders of the land of Egypt. And all the house of Joseph and his brethren and his father's house, only their little ones, and their flocks and their herds stayed in Goshen. And there went up with him both chariots and horsemen, and it was a very great company. And they came to the threshing floor of Atad, and it, and it recounts the burial of, of uh, Israel. Okay, Now look at verse 14. Drop down to verse 14. And Joseph returned into Egypt, and he and his brethren, and all that went up with him to bury his father after he had buried his father. Now, in verse 15, we, get, we really get to the, to the crux of the whole matter. This, is, this story of Joseph, this whole story of, of the beginning of the nation of Israel, from Abraham, you know, or from Noah to Abraham and so forth, it all culminates with this. The end of the beginning, okay? When Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, you would think that they would have got the message by now. That Joseph did not hold against them what they did to him. Just like Christ doesn't hold against us what we've done through faith in his blood, Joseph set his brethren free. But they, didn't, they still didn't get it. I wonder how many people labor under the, the perception that somehow God is so mad at me that he could never forgive me. Now think about these brothers. Think what they did to their brother. Sold him into slavery. Hated him. Think about we, maybe things that we've done against God. How could we think that God couldn't forgive us for the things that we've done. Listen to this. They saw that their father was dead, and they said, Joseph will preventure hate us and will certainly requite all, us all the evil which we did unto him. If he the one to do that, he'd have done that a long time ago. But they said, well, he didn't do it for our father's sake. Now he's really going to get even with us. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph saying, that father did command before he died. They're still... So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren. He had already done that. And it wasn't his, his earthly father telling him that. His heavenly father told him that. He was listening to his heavenly father. He says, Forgive, I pray thee now. This is what the, the, the sons sent to him. This is what our dad said. Uh, I pray thee now that uh, forgive. I pray thee now the, the trespass of your brethren and their sin, for they did unto thee evil. And now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of your father. 
And Joseph, when, he, when they said that to him, he wept. It was almost like, listen, what, what do you think I've been doing for you all this time? I wonder, do, do, I wonder does, does Jesus weep when we don't think he's able to forgive us for something we've done? I'm talking to believers now. When we refuse to believe, when we think that we've done something so horrible that he can't forgive us, and I'm not saying that to give us a license to do whatever we feel like doing. Like Kathy shared her testimony, you know, sometimes God will deal with us. He, he deals with us gently. He, he teaches us. He, he encourages us. He, he leads us along. He doesn't want to beat us up. And sometimes we think, do we think that we're so, we're so horrible, we're so great that God could never forget our sin? I think it's a pride thing. I really do. Joseph wept. I think there's lots of times that Jesus weeps when he tries. He offers forgiveness. He wants to make you a new creature. He wants to do everything he can for you. And we resist him because we kind of set this thing up. Well, God can never love me. I can't tell you how many times people have said, well, I'm not, going, I'm not worthy to go to church. Have you ever heard that? Well, ain't nobody worthy to go to church. I mean, who's worthy? I'm not worthy. There's nobody here worthy. If we were worthy, we wouldn't need forgiveness. Nobody's worthy. Joseph wept when they spake unto him. And his brethren also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we be thy servants. And Joseph said unto them, all wrapped up, this whole story about Joseph just wraps up right here, right here. Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? Now there's another side light to this. Do you know that when you hold a grudge against somebody, you're putting yourself in the place of God? Do you know when you hold bitterness or when you hold uh, resentment, when when you refuse to forgive, you're, you're, you're putting yourself in the place of God? Joseph, by every right, by every human intuition, if, if Joseph would have had all his brothers put to death, there wouldn't have been a person in Egypt would have, that would have said they deserved it once they heard the story. After what they did to him. Joseph, who was the second most powerful man in Egypt, could have snapped his fingers and had anything done at his word. He was, from a human standpoint, he was in a place almost of God. Pharaoh was only above him from a human standpoint. But Joseph knew he never allowed his position to get him to a place where he thought he was more than what he was. He says, am I in the place of God? But as for you, you thought evil against me. If this whole thing wraps up with this, this is such a perfect picture of Christ. And really a picture of how we ought to be. He said... You thought evil against me. You wanted to hurt me. You wanted to kill me. You wanted to get me out of the picture. You hated me. You were envious of me. You were jealous of me. And they were. He wasn't making this up. He says, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. God took your evil And he used it for something good. And thank God for Joseph, who was so after God's own heart that he did not allow his flesh, human nature, to rise up and cause him to be bitter, resentful, hateful, vindictive. Now we talk about David being a man after God's own heart, and he was. I'll tell you one thing. Joseph was a man after God's own heart. Just as Jesus, when he was hanging on that cross, said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That's what Joseph said. He said, forgive him. I forgive you. Is it it hard to say, I forgive you? Is that hard? It is hard sometimes. But I think it's a lot worse when we don't say it. You know, it might be hard to say it, but once we say it and once we do it, things get a lot, a lot better. If we hold on to that, here a year or so ago we did that book about, you know, the, the bait of Satan, about being offended. 
and holding on to resentment and bitterness and anger. It's so much easier to say, I'll let you go. It's all right. I forgive you. That's what Jesus did. He says, As for you, you thought evil against me. But God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Now, therefore, fear ye not. I will nourish you and your little ones and be comforted. And he comforted them and spoke kindly unto them. The beginning of the end is this picture of Christ. It's a picture of Christ. Who wants to nourish us and comfort us and forgive us and bless us and use us if we would just set aside all the stuff it says in Romans chapter right we have we have this we no longer have the spirit of fear but we have the spirit of adoption where we but we can cry Abba father how precious at the very beginning, the story of Christ is from page one to the very end of the book. And we don't see a greater picture of it than right here. We know that they dwelt in Egypt for another several hundred years, 400 years. If you read on in the book of Exodus, and I'm, 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 we're not going on into Exodus. I'm not sure what we're going to be doing, you know, Bible study Wednesday night, but I don't think it's going to be Exodus, but... If you go on in the book of Exodus, you find out that the Pharaoh, who was Joseph's buddy, he died. Joseph died. And another guy came in. And he didn't think too highly of the Jews, the Hebrews. He didn't think too highly of them. And they became slaves. And they became they, under cruel taskmasters. And for 400 years, they were in bondage until God sent another deliverer. But this story of Joseph... The book of the beginnings, the end of the beginning, the end of Genesis, the story of God's forgiveness and his grace and his mercy and his love toward us. I thank God. It says in the Psalms, it says, blessed is the man to whom his sin is not imputed unto him. If we could just grab a hold of that, I really think that most of the fear that I've experienced you know, there, there is a healthy fear of God, okay? There's a healthy fear of God. But most of the fear I've experienced is because I thought I'd done something that God couldn't forgive. There's nothing you can do. And when, when we get that in our mindset, you know, I think it takes down a wall. It's like our sister was sharing. We, we put these walls up. And we think God is this big, you know, it's like, uh, remember in, in the Wizard of Oz? They went in there, and there was that smoke, and blah, 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 yeah. until little Toto went over and opened up the curtain, there was a guy in there with the We think God's this big ogre up there. Blah, blah, blah. But Jesus Christ said, come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. That's what Joseph said to his brethren. Come on, I'll, I'll take care of you. I'll feed your little ones. I'll give you rest. That's how God ends the first book of the Bible. Letting us know. He lets us know that he wants to give us rest. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Anybody have any comments or questions?